So we were kind of talking before we started this about your Paul McCartney interview experience. Yeah. And I was just curious because of all the people you interviewed, I think McCartney might be the one who is asked the same questions the most. Yes. I think most of his interviews that I hear these days tend to be like, ah, okay, they've hit the button for story number 7B yes. Yes. about how he met John Lennon at the Walton Village Fate and Lennon got the words to the song wrong and blah, 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 blah. And you must have been one of the few interviews he's done in the last 30 years where almost every question was something that he hasn't really talked about before. Yeah, it was interviewing him that I realized the opportunity I was suddenly in the middle of because I was asking him questions that nobody had ever bothered to ask him. What's your opinion on Rolling Stone and the coverage you got in your relationship to its publisher? And it turned out because of the way that Rolling Stone was sort of betwixt and between the Beatles breakup, you know, that they were partisans for John Lennon and that John and Yoko used Rolling Stone as kind of a platform to telegraph their independence from the Beatles. Well, it turns out that Paul had an opinion about that <laughs> and he felt strongly about it and he didn't trust Rolling Stone as a result or he had a kind of ambivalent feelings about, and sometimes not ambivalent about, Jan Wenner. And of course, when they're trashing his solo records like Ram, like I mentioned earlier, that was yet more evidence to him that he was not going to get a lot of traction with these guys. And then over the long term of five decades of Rolling Stone, the invention of the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, which is an adjunct of Rolling Stone in many ways, he's observing, Paul McCartney is, that his legacy as a member of the Beatles is being kind of like downplayed to John Lennon, making McCartney the second banana, in which he was like, no, the songs are Lennon-McCartney. We co-wrote these songs. So he resents that. And now he's at this stage in his life where he's really wanting to make clear what he believes his legacy is and should be and what he thinks of Jan Wenner and Rolling Stone, where they play into that negatively in his mind. So when he was unleashing all of this stuff, I was just gobsmacked, as they say. You know, I was just really amazed. And then another opportunity came up where I had found this Polaroid in Jan Wenner's archive that was sort of in an envelope that was addressed to Johan Wiener, which was some kind of joke <laughs> towards Jan Wenner. And inside was a Polaroid of Paul, John, Linda McCartney, Keith Moon of The Who, and uh, May Pang, who Turns out it was John Lennon's lover at the time, right? And a personal assistant. And they're all cavorting in a garden. And underneath on the white part on the Polaroid, it says, how do you sleep? Question mark, question mark, question mark. And it was sent to Jan. And I thought this, I got to get to the bottom of this, wow. right? Because that's weird. Yeah. So I went to him and I said, tell me about this Polaroid. And that's when he unpacked the whole story about how he and John Lennon reconciled after the breakup of the Beatles and how Yoko had asked Paul while she was broken up with John Lennon, she asked Paul to go as an emissary to John and say that she would take him back. And it was Paul's visit to John Lennon in Los Angeles, California in 1974, when this picture was taken, that precipitated John and Yoko getting back together and moving to the Dakota. And he, I don't think he'd spoken much about this time. And he told some fabulous stories about it. And some of them are in the book. Did you feel like, I mean, you probably like listened or like seen a bunch of McCartney interviews. Yeah. Did you notice like a drop of persona when he was, instead of telling an anecdote that he has been rehearsed and Definitely. refined as Definitely. opposed to actually just talking about stuff? Well, here's what I'm going to say two things. One is, yes, there were moments definitely where I saw him when he was telling the story of how Jan had, in his mind, screwed him over on the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame induction. He was unvarnished. He was like, Jan promised me I'd be inducted after I did him a solid you know, did him a favor. And I pick up the paper the next year and I'm not inducted. And he says a bunch of choice words. Yeah, you yeah. Know? And I thought, well, he wouldn't just be saying that if he didn't mean it. And the other thing is, is that when you're interviewing people about this subject in particular, it's not like you come to them and they're just innocently waiting for the question. He has an agenda, Paul McCartney. He's thinking, you know yeah. what? I'm finally going to lay this one down. You know, I'm going to tell him what I think. And I, I knew this was the case because towards the end of the interview, he looks at me and he's like, this isn't going to be a whitewash, is it? And I said, no. And he said, good. And I thought, oh, well, that's interesting. You know, he meant to, he wants these stories out there. And I thought they were important stories. I mean, you're talking about a view of the Beatles' history and legacy through a different lens. You know, the lens of a magazine that mediated a lot of their mythology, Rolling Stone. John Wenner had a lot of power in that. At the outset, was a John Lennon devotee and took John Lennon's side, really. And a really, like... And it's very clear in the book that probably cuts into the album reviews as well for McCartney, but just the narrative of Lennon as the authentic one. 
Yeah. And like even that word authentic has been so like terrible, corrupted and yes. and co-opted and degraded through the years to it, where yeah. the point where it almost means nothing now. It's a magazine. It's not just passively reporting the facts of people's careers. There's an, there's an overarching sort of meta narrative about these artists that keeps getting reinforced over decades of Absolutely. articles. Yeah, and there's a pantheon that got created. And naturally, the rock stars who were going to survive and turn themselves into institutions and businesses were going to be the heads of the pantheon. And those are the people that could cooperate with Jan Wenner. They were the people that understood that this was a business, like Mick Jagger, Pete Townsend, Yoko Ono, Bruce Springsteen, Bono. These are people that understand, you know what? I know how to create my own image. I want to shape my own image. Being friends with Jan Wenner is in my benefit to shape my own image, and they did. 